With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW group. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Good evening and welcome to the World of Martial Arts interview with Brian Trenchard-Smith. What inspired you and how did you get in touch with Golden Harvest for an interview with Bruce Lee? Well, uh, first of all, you know, they, Golden Harvest, were going to release Bruce Lee's Chinese pictures uh, in Australia through a distributor that I had a relationship with. And they yeah, wanted me to come up with some promotional ideas to sort of ease the Australian public, which is not necessarily known for its multicultural attitudes back in 1960, 1970. It is much more multicultural now. Uh, yeah. But, uh, uh, Bruce had done, he, he'd shot Enter the Dragon, started to shoot Game of Death, his per- next personal project after the way of yeah, the Dragon. Yeah, that's right, uh, yeah. And it had to be interrupted because Warner said, hey, we've got this American co-production that's hot to trot. And uh, can you just suspend shooting? We'll come in you know, for, for five weeks and, uh, and shoot it. And then you can go back to your personal movie. Uh, and yeah, no doubt they were interested in, in that too. Uh, but they wanted a, a more American-styled movie. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, in, in many respects, they were hedging their bets. They had to have, uh, you know, they had to have a white co-star and they had to have a black supporting actor. Uh, yeah. Uh, so they, anyway, so my, uh, my suggestion was, why did I go to Hong Kong and make a documentary about uh, this new world of Kung Fu? Uh, in in Hong Kong and and the wonderful movies that come out of it, many of whom you know, many of which I'd seen. Uh, oh, wow. Been a fan of Shaw Brothers cinema, which was right. tended to be shown in in, in Chinatown Chinese only theaters, uh, both right. in Ligon Street in uh, in Soho and uh, um, in Dixon Street uh, in Sydney, <clears throat> and uh, so. Um, I, 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 you know, I've been watching Asian cinema since, you know, The Seven Samurai when I was 14. Um, right. So I was a fan. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, but uh, so I, I said, you know, I, let me go to Hong Kong and shoot this documentary about uh, the world of Kung Fu and interview Bruce Lee and have him talk about his vision uh, of, you know, uh, of cinema as uh, from an Asian perspective. And they thought, great. And I was funded to do that. And of course, I had written a you know, six page you know, outline for a movie that was out subsequently called The Man from Hong Kong. And I had it in my bag. And I was going to find a way, obviously, having hopefully ingratiated oh, my uh, to That's slip it to him. Uh, wow. But, but um, then the plane to Hong Kong touched down in uh, Jakarta Airport, and the newspaper hoardings in the transit lounge were saying Bruce Lee dies. So I thought, oh dear, oh dear. Well, I've committed myself on the to this documentary and committed funds to it on the basis that um, uh, Bruce will feature in it and with an exclusive interview. Um, but yeah, uh, the uh, carrying on to Hong Kong, I thought, well, okay, you know, uh, how do you deal with the unexpected? I think we yeah. touched on that a little conversation with Mitzi. Um, and uh, the 
um, uh, the, the uh, upshot up was that Raymond Chow graciously provided time and he and some of his executives uh, gave us time to talk about Bruce Lee. They gave me clips from all Bruce's films, which including clips from Game of Death, the young as wow. young Game of Death. Wow. And the permission to use them. <clears throat> and um, so I did emerge with something that I could use. And I, I did this one hour documentary and then I came back um, the next year um, to, uh, to do, well, later uh, in the year, Let's just hold you there, Brian, just just nice and slow, because this is really interesting. So, as I said, so you must have got permission or you'd already sent in front to actually go to Golden Harvest. You'd already got that yeah. intro. You'd already yes, got the, that intro. The, the distributor you know, who'd been dealing with uh, Raymond Chow for the distribution of the films in Australia uh, made that arrangement. I was their, their designee, so to speak. Uh, that you know, it, it, obviously, if uh, it, I, I would not have been able to cold call my way into Golden. No, Park. no. Uh, but though I've been quite successful cold calling my way into various places, I went to to Tokyo in 1968 and basically just rang up TV companies and film companies and said, yeah. "Hey, I'm I'm a television executive from Australia and uh, and I I make." dynamic promos and I have a reel of my promos I'd love you to, to, to see them and I'd love to learn about how you make promos it was my cunning way to get in and learn more about color television because Australia oh, was fantastic. Uh, anyway cold calling can work uh, but in this yeah. case uh, an introduction works better and uh, yeah. so I, I I had gone up done this thing and it it went on and, and, and I'd done a lot of other work I made a new trailer for Fists of Fury, um, a new trailer for The Big Boss, uh, which we used the American print of Return of the Dragon, which was the, the way yeah. that sold The, the Big yeah. Boss in, in, in the US. And um, yeah. unfortunately, it was lacking the wonderful shot of Bruce bisecting this guy's head with a, a saw. Uh, yeah, which I think they even cut that out for Singapore. They, 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 they cut that out. G yeah. Going back to you, to going back to you, you, you got an interview, an exclusive interview with Raymond Chow. Who else can you remember? You got? I know you said the executives, but did you get any other of the actors that were around? Because I mean, George Lazenby must have been around at that time. Um, well, he, he was not in Hong Kong. Uh, we he was uh, he was in Hong Kong, but he was not available for interview. You can imagine oh, right. the days immediately after Bruce's death. Uh, yeah, it was about four days later that uh, uh, that I was able to. Well, four days after my arrival, I checked in with them the moment I arrived, and I did. You know, within the rest of the day, I got a call back. I immediately went out, and started shooting Hong Kong streets and background material, uh, and you know, waited for responses to my hotel room. Uh, yeah. And, uh, this is before cell phones. This is before internet. Um, yeah. so, you know when you don't you don't you know uh, take care of emergency unexpected events um, and rescheduling that quickly as you can today. Uh, but anyway, we managed. Um, so I, I I shot a bunch of stuff and uh, found I shot interviews with uh, um, with Andre Morgan. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, important. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, also Ricky Yui of Pan Asia um, and uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, and uh, um, then went back and was able to make a, a one hour. So I think you filled in some of the questions I've, I've, I've asked you. But one of the things was uh, because you were in Hong Kong at that time, what did you find? Uh, what was the atmosphere like in Hong Kong? Um, when people had found out, but well, as you'd found out, and th found out that their hero Bruce Lee had died, what was the atmosphere like in Hong Kong at the time? Because you were there in '73 when that had happened. The atmosphere in Hong Kong was um, severely depressed, shall we say? I mean, you, you could tell that people were not going around with smiling faces, um, and there, you know, there was just 
a, a, a sense of a national tragedy because Bruce right. Lee was um, a national hero who had elevated uh, you know, Chinese martial arts to something that the world could see. And uh, this was you know, had been proven by the box office uh, and would soon be proven by Enter the Dragon when it would come out. Uh, uh, it, he, he had given you know, class and, and dignity to Chinese characters, something that he felt was lacking from uh, American representation. Uh, and yeah, he, he, had, he had devised his own Kung Fu series uh, that ultimately went forward with David Carradine in the role because yeah. they, Holly was not ready for a full Chinese uh, actor to be, you know, to headline a, a TV series. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, American audiences were even more conservative then than they could be considered to be today. Uh, and uh, so it had to be, you know, uh, a, a character justified by being half Chinese, half white, could have half white, you see. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and, and so, you know, it, it was not what he had in mind. He would have been, you know, kind of amazing. I think headlining the yeah, conference yeah. series, but, and then his so, parts of, of Green Hornet, you know Bruce Lee's parts in Green Hornet, and he was paid four hundred dollars a week on that show, yeah. four hundred dollars yeah. a week. Uh, yeah. Though a Hong Kong distributor bought the theatrical rights to Green Hornet, and basically cut all of Bruce's scenes together and made a movie out of them. Yeah. Uh, because with the magic of dubbing, you can turn other people's dialogue into anything. So Absolutely. he fashioned uh, a, a movie out of uh, you know, his best fight scenes in the, or all of his fight scenes in the 13 episodes of The Green Hornet. And that, yeah. that had, had established, uh, as far as Raymond Chow was concerned, what his box office appeal would be in Asia. And Raymond yeah. was sighted man and he could see that this could travel uh internationally i mean i will I, and that was my feeling too and that's the why yeah i you know chose martial arts as a, a genre to uh get into for yeah an unknown film industry like australia how do you break into the international film market uh well action is the universal currency uh of uh, cinema a uh, good punch up plays well uh, in America, in uh, you know Sweden. Well, less so in Sweden. They don't like punch ups so much. <laughs> a, a good punch up will play well in any language in the world. Uh, yeah. And so that's what I set out to make with with Man from Hong Kong. Uh, oh, well, we'll let, let's get to let's, we're going a bit in front of ourselves, and I want to keep you focused because okay. the stuff that I want is amazing, and and you're saying all the right things, which is fantastic. You had the footage. You'd gone to get Bruce Lee and you didn't get Bruce Lee. How did you put the world of Kung Fu together? Well, luckily I had Bruce Lee in movie form. So yeah. I could talk about him and have other people talk about him. And then we could cut to him um, punching someone else to the ground or demonstrating the, the kind of flexibility and speed with which uh, he, he did all his maneuvers. Uh, yeah. So it 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 it, it yeah. You know, as as an old trailer maker, it it it, it you know, the standard techniques applied. So, so did you? Did, were you able to use photographs and stuff like that and Burns effect to actually put it together? No, no. I just did straight cutting. People talked about him, and then boom, 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 boom. And I'd maybe do a little line of in, uh, of uh, of voiceover, you know, over the. The opening uh, over the sequence that I was cutting to, or just make it a straight cut that you know where the ironic juxtaposition made perfect sense. Uh, so now comes the big question. I am, and, and I think you'll come to agree, is I am a big Bruce Lee fan, <laughs> and so I, 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 therefore your documentary eludes me. So I am desperate to see the world of kung fu. Um, so what I'd like to say to you is, first of all, 
because you've said something there that's really interesting and about Australia not taking on, um, you know, and not being used to this genre, and you were the first one to actually put it on TV. Can you explain to us or can you give us some feedback on what the response to your documentary on Australian TV was and um, why is it not being made available to the rest of the world? The response to the world of Kung Fu on Australian television was good. People liked it. I mean, they didn't want to, you know, immediately a, a, a give it an Emmy or something. They thought, whoa, this is interesting. It rated well uh, and rated sufficiently well for me to see, well, we could do a follow-up film to this. Uh, in fact, we could send uh, uh, Grant Page, Australia's leading stuntman, who I managed at that time and created vehicles for him, and as you have seen, uh, and sent him to Hong Kong and to, the, to find out who is the successor to Bruce Lee. Uh, and uh, I pitched that to a rival network that had seen the ratings uh, of uh, the, the, the world of, of Kung Fu. And they said, hey, go ahead and do that. So uh, it, it was, you know, Golden Harvest were happy uh, that uh, I was going to have another bite of the apple, so to speak, because it could only be good publicity for them. Uh, so uh, the World of Kung Fu documentary was then uh, offered to British broadcasters. It was banned in England for being too violent for television. Thank you. Um, and... Uh, so uh, we're not going to fight that, uh, and uh, and it had lots of it had nunchuckers in it, which were cut out of all the Bruce Lee films in yeah. the UK. They were cut out yeah. of my from Hong Kong as well. Uh, so um, so you know that that's life. Um, uh, but there was obviously no future for for it on. Uh, standard broadcast television worldwide. So I withdrew it. I then cannibalized some of the footage and put it into the, the new documentary when I went up to Hong Kong with Grant Page and did some stunts up there, interviewed a whole range of more people. And that at that time, uh, uh, George Lazenby was doing... Uh, uh, he, he was doing stoner. Uh, and yeah, he was doing Stoner and he followed it with Queen's Ransom. Yes. Well, he, he was doing Stoner with Angela Mao. And I was yeah. there when they filmed him in a cage and people were you know, thrusting uh, sharp pointed instruments at him. Uh, or, yeah, you know, luckily with plastic tips. Uh, and uh, um, so I got to meet George and talk to him and he would be the obvious villain. Uh, from my man from Hong Kong. Now, uh, by this stage, um, uh, I, I was then able to pitch my film, uh, my proposed film to Raymond Chow, and they said they would think about it. And they eventually got back to me and said, well, if you can get half the money in Australia, we'll go, come up with the other half, but you will have Wong Yu, our previously number one star before Bruce came along. Uh, and hopefully we'll be our number, the number one star in Asia again. You know, you know his history, one-armed boxer, one-armed swordsman, etc. He he was big, but Bruce was bigger. Uh, and then Jimmy, you know, unfortunately with his next few films did not hit the the mark uh, that somehow that Bruce had uh, had made, because basically Jimmy is a really good street fighter, uh, whereas Bruce. Uh, his flexibility, his his athleticism, his uh, incredible speed. He was just so superior. And that's what Hong Kong audiences really were kind of expecting from their top martial arts stars. Uh, Jimmy was, you know, a personality who, who was very athletic and uh, kind of, um, you know, a bit sort of rebellious and uh, did get into fights with policemen occasionally uh, when they stopped him for speeding. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I was told this just before he arrived in Australia uh, for my film. Um, and just bear in mind, Jimmy does get into fights with policemen. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, just, just, 
just hold in there. What? So just so that I, I, I put this to bed. So what has happened to the world of Kung Fu? Is it not in an entirety anymore now? It's not available. It is not available. Uh, it was shot on what is, was called 16 millimeter reversal. It, uh, it, 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 it was a, a, a cheap form of 16 millimeter um, where he, the negative become, well, you, you generate a positive print uh, and uh, then you cut a, a duplicate positive print uh, and then you make a negative off that. But, you know, you can also, you know, make, you, you can make a succession of positive prints without creating a master negative. So uh, I simply stripped the A and B rolls of uh, the, uh, you know, of world of Kung Fu which were sort of made up in a checkerboard fashion so that they can be printed in one continuous run. Um, and I stripped out the shots that would be useful, uh, a lot of Hong Kong background shots. Uh, and uh, I still had all of the Bruce Lee clips. Uh, and uh, um, so, uh, I, and I hadn't used a Game of Death uh, because I, in the previous one, because I'd just been promoting the uh, Bruce Lee films that Australia had not seen yet and that should yep. know about and the rest could wait. Uh, so in this way, I was able to uh, incorporate a bit of Enter the Dragon and uh, a bit of Game of Death. And that is called Kung Fu Killers, um, which I made for the princely sum of $13,000 of actual cash cost. Uh, fly to Hong Kong, shoot for a week, um, uh, and fly back and do post-production. Um, and I sold that uh, at a small profit to Australian television. Um, but again, uh, and then I have subsequently put it onto uh, DVDs, uh, yeah. uh, some of my work. So that is the yeah. all you can see of the world of Kung Fu uh, is in um, Kung Fu Killers, which, for which I shot you know, some additional material right. obviously of uh, and uh, and I, I shot other I shot scenes from the from a love epidemic in Hong Kong as well seeing as I was there um, I took Grant to the bottoms up bar and filmed yeah ladies there this is a bar used in a James Bond movie um, yeah uh, man from Hong Kong no oh, no man with a golden gun man with a golden gun same thing but better um, <laughs> So let's let, let's move on because um, Enter the Dragon had a James Bond feel to it. Mm. Um, so, and you've talked about George Lazenby. So, how did you get George Lazenby? Was he under contract with Golden Harvest, as he had already made a film with Jimmy Wang Yu called Queen's Ransom? Um, how did you get? J uh, was he still part of Golden Harvest, or did he sign a contract specifically for you for Man from Hong Kong? And and how did you work? get Lazenby to be there and, you know, get that feel um, of Bond into your movie? Well, I always had a Bond feeling. Well, let me put it another way. Uh, George Lazenby had signed a three picture contract with Raymond Chow and the plan was to partner him with Bruce Lee in a number of films. And in fact, they were going to have a dinner uh, with Raymond uh, uh, and Bruce and George uh, at a particular restaurant the night that Bruce died that afternoon. And, uh, and no doubt what the subjects would be and whether George would have participated in the game of death and things like that. Uh, it, all of that would have been discussed, but sadly, um, yeah, Bruce uh, did, uh, he died and, and with a great, yeah, a loss to world cinema. So George was under contract to Ren Chow uh, and they saw obviously when I came up with Kung Fu, uh, came up to, when I came up for, to shoot Kung Fu Killers, we had further conversations about my idea for The Man from Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, it was pretty much set that Jimmy Wong Yu would uh, play the hero and George would play the villain. Works for me. And George was you know, an Australian actor. So the co-star of a co-production would be um, Australian. Uh, and it was, an, it was a, first, a first 
is before a co-production treaty between Australia and, uh, and China. Uh, this was the first Australian co-production with an Asian film company. There had been co-production with France and I think a couple, and uh, maybe even Germany, um, or maybe and Greece, but uh, Lee Robinson had done a couple of French co-productions. Um, anyway, but this was the first with an Asian country, and I hoped it would take, I hoped it would set a precedent, uh, and there'd be lots yeah. more uh, martial arts movies uh, that could uh, span, you know, uh, stories could span Australia and, uh, and Asia. Uh, the Japanese had come and made a Western in the Australian desert. Um, uh, oh. Yes, a, a sort of in the early 70s before. Yeah, so uh, they, they were venturing outside of Japan to get their audiences interested uh, and uh, give the their Japanese audience something different. And they thought they'd do a sort of Japanese spaghetti western in Australia. I've never seen it, but they did. They did right. shoot them, and you you should track it down. And, I may uh, do that. Yeah. What 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 was what was Jimmy like um, uh, to work with? And uh, did he ever convey to you his feelings about Bruce Lee? You know, was he happy with Bruce Lee, or was he feeling a little bit envious that Bruce had taken some of his limelight, something like that? Well, it seemed politic not to talk about Bruce Lee too much. Uh, it's okay. better to talk about Jimmy. I think that's the same with all stars, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, you, you know, uh, you're, you're working with George Clooney and you say, yeah, but let me compare you to Gary Cooper. <laughs> uh, you know, when you have that same square jaw, you, have, you, know, uh, you have that sort of clean cut look and you seem like a decent guy. And, and he really epitomized uh, those qualities. So don't you agree, uh, George? Um, so I think that would not be a good approach you know, for a director to make with the star. Uh, yeah. so, but yeah. You know, <sighs> My problems with Jimmy were that he had directed and produced and reportedly written eight films, uh, uh, you know, ranging in budget from eighty thousand to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Here was here was I, you know, with a budget of five hundred thousand dollars for my first feature film, having made dramatized documentaries beforehand. Um, so. Uh, he certainly was very anxious that things be done entirely his way, and they weren't always, and they, well, they weren't at all sometimes. Uh, and he he just thought that I was a you know a, a privileged you know British <laughs> probably sounded like the you know Hong Kong br British policeman that he didn't yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't think he beat up. British policeman, he beat up, beat up Chinese policeman. Um, ah, but let's stop, stop you there, Brian, because he did beat you up in the movie, oh. and also you set yourself on fire. Tell us about why you did that. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, it seemed like a good idea at the time. As uh, um, <laughs> no, two two right. things. Uh, I yeah. Call it vanity, whatever, and call it you know my my wanting to at least participate some way in martial arts. I thought, well, I'll write myself a little cameo part here. Um, you know, that could be arrogance of Hitchcock, you see, uh, but but not deserved. Uh, uh, and uh, I I I thought I can probably handle a simple thing and get beaten up and that will be good. And what's more, it'll save money because there's a scene that has to be shot in a Sydney set. Uh, uh, it's the, where, you know, 50% of the film has to be shot in Australia, 50% in Hong Kong, and yet 90% of the movie is set in Australia. So a whole bunch of, uh, Austra Australian scenes have to be shot in Hong Kong on sets. Um, so there is a martial arts academy fight in which I uh, notice the intruder, unwisely confront the intruder, get the shit quickly kicked out of me, 
gave me the opportunity to be punched through toffee glass, which I've always wanted to do, uh, and then foolishly rise from the dead again and rush out into the corridor where the elevators are and pursue uh, Jimmy there. And those scenes were shot in Australia first, and then the Martial Arts Academy fight scene was shot later. So I, in the first part of the shooting, rush out, down the corridor with blood streaming from my forehead uh, because I had, you know, the, the plan was I'd be punched through glass. Uh, and uh, then we, you know, uh, contrive in a somewhat unbelievable way uh, to stop the elevator and uh, have me slide down the lift shaft and he gets up and you know, he run down the cable and he gets up out of the lift and we fight on top and dodge the counterweight. And then he you know, knocks me down and uh, generally stamps on me until I am lifeless. Um, his attitude to this was, oh, you want to do this? Okay, well, fine. And uh, he, he, he told his you know, fellows, I'm just going to treat him like I would treat any Hong Kong stuntman. Uh, <laughs> which yeah, sometimes involved a little bit of contact. Um, certainly that punch to the stomach that doubles me over um, in, on top of the elevator, and there was contact there. Uh, so uh, my reaction is quite genuine. Uh, it was. Truth in performance. I always believe yeah. it. Uh, yeah. uh, anyway. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that was that aspect of it. Uh, I was always striving in my films to push the envelope a little bit and give the audience something that they haven't normally seen. And with Grant Page <clears throat> and a stuntman buddy of his, Bob Woodham, we discovered a fire retardant gel, which was called water gel and was generally you know, soaked in a blanket and used to throw over an industrial fire, uh, which, you know, where you didn't want to use water. Uh, and, but we thought, oh, well, why don't you throw it over a burning man? And what's more, what if the burning man has got this gel all over his body? Um, and that will, for a short period, insulate him from the flame because it, it, the water gel automatically puts out flame upon contact. So if you have a long john soaked in water gel and you have another layer of cotton that keeps the water gel at bay for a while and then you throw the costume on top and you fuel the costume and you light it up and boom, off you go before the gel can soak through the insulating layer uh, and put out the flame, then you can have a nice little burn. Uh, and if you twirl around you want to make it good for the camera so one thing is don't inhale uh you know, fumes from coming off the the flames so if you move around the flames you know go off you you know where to take a breath um and uh so uh, i've done five of them small ones you know, uh, there are pictures of me. Uh, it's, it, I think it's one that's fairly public um, that I did on top of a uh, the, the Carriage Odeon building in Auckland to promote the man from Hong Kong's opening in 75. Um, anyway, I, uh, I wanted to uh, have George Lazenby catch fire during his climactic fight with Jimmy Wong Yu. And, and water gel enables us to do fire stunts without a fire suit, where, you know, the whole you know, head and, and encased. And, uh, and so you could only film those shots in, in wide shot. Uh, you never saw the participant, but if you could actually see, wow, that former James Bond, George Lazenby is actually on fire while he's trying to throw punches. Wouldn't Fantastic. That, wouldn't that be cool? Um, and so I said to George, well, how about it? Um, it's perfectly safe. Uh, uh, and I will show you. Uh, and so they, they got some old costuming out from the, the, from the wardrobe department and 
you know, I was, Grant gelled me up, uh, I put the costume on, fueled me, set me on fire, and I you know, demonstrated it to George. Uh, and uh, uh, he, you know, said, okay, well, all right. Um, and it, you know, it, you know, it went fine, except uh, for one little thing that we hadn't thought about. And so, you know, I, 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 I have to claim, you know, I have to say it was an irresponsible decision uh, fueled by ambition uh, that I should not have asked George to do this. Uh, and a, the one thing we had not taken into account is that the, the additional layer of costuming might make it difficult for him to get his jacket off. The plan was uh, once he was kicked into the fire, came out on fire, continued to fight, uh, he'd be struggling to get the jacket off and then throw it at Jimmy. Uh, and there would be sufficient action in all of that for the two cameras to show, wow, that is George Lazenby on fire. Um, and two things happened just before, when, when the, the cameras were rolling and getting up to speed, Jimmy went, just left his mark and squirted some more fuel on George's back, thinking it might have, that wasn't quite enough. George said, what's going on? And I said, don't worry, George. I mean, I should have said cut. That's just not according to procedure. A any first assistant director today would have absolutely, yeah, would, would have not allowed me to do what I did and would, uh, uh, and, and correctly so, uh, and would have called a halt to proceedings when someone did not follow you know, the bouncing ball along the, you know, the procedure. Um, but anyway, we, you know, it was seconds, the cameras were going up to 120 frames per second. Uh, uh, and I called action and it, it went it smoothly up to the point when George is trying to take the jacket off uh, and it was too tight around the elbows and he couldn't get it off and the carefully rehearsed movements that we'd done over and over again so it was just theoretically like clockwork uh, were, were broken and he didn't know what to do and he kind of was getting a bit panicky uh, and uh, so Grant rushed in, tackled him, brought him to the ground, and we threw the wad gel blanket uh, over him. And the net result was that on one, one hand there, there was a patch uh, where he'd rubbed the gel off his hand uh, and it got burned. Uh, and I, I don't know which degree burn it was, but I don't think there's a mark. Um, uh, there today. The water gel has a, a has certain healing properties in it anyway, uh, and it, it's worked on on burn victims and yeah. uh, and even a, a stunt man who seemed to have been burned badly. Well, he, even Grant Grant got burned on Mad Dog Morgan all, all up here, but water gel, yeah, it was fine, uh, no scars. So that was yeah. George was not scarred. Uh, George was pissed off. Uh, he was not happy. I'd said, it, you won't get hurt. And there he was, he'd been hurt. And that was wrong. And, uh, you know, I did a bad thing. Uh, and uh, Talk, um, Talking about getting hurt, one of the big things that was in the press, um, and I've sent you a photo, I've sent you a little treasure, and I will get you one if you want. Um, I've sent you the front cover of Dragon magazine. Don't mm -hmm. know if you ever saw it. Um, and when you look at your uh, inbox, you will see the photograph of that magazine. If you got it, I'll send it to you. Uh, but it was reported um, that poor old Jimmy Wang Yu fell out of the sky near and uh, to his near death when the hand glider collapsed in midair. How did you take that one? No, well, that, that's an exaggeration. Um, okay. We wanted to train Jimmy uh, to be in a hang glider uh, that would be tethered to the, the ground, maybe about 30 feet up uh, and into the wind and held there, the wind would, yeah, and tethered. So we could then get his close-ups against the sail for as wide as we could without seeing the tethers. 
but seeing that the wind was definitely affecting the sail and he was definitely in the air and he could make those little movements like that and that would cut in with the the shots that Grant Page would do in the uh, in, 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 in the kite. Um, so in the course of uh, giving him training one Sunday, um, he you know, got up, but then uh, something failed. I wasn't there, but, uh, uh, and it did a nosedive into the ground. Uh, and I think the bar, the, the A-frame the bar, caught him at the bottom of the ribs. And so the doctor said he had maybe cracked two ribs. Uh, and so it wasn't a near-death experience, uh, but it, naturally, when you want to get publicity for the film, a Hong Kong newspaper will say anything. Uh, ah, right. You cleared that one up. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, I, I, you know I, I, yeah, I don't actually think that, uh, well, I, yeah, I, I think the audience enjoys suspense uh, on the screen. Um, and they enjoy, you know, stories of courageous actors. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I, uh, I, I don't think it's, you know, wise to exaggerate things. I've told you the true story of how Yeah, I, no, that's good. I, no, no, I, 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 I remember the Daily Mirror. It was a full, it was a double page spread in the Daily Mirror. Jimmy Wang, you know, nearly dies, you know what I mean? So the new yeah. Bruce Lee sort of film. Um, what were you, I think you were you at the London premiere? Were you at the London premiere of Man from Hong Kong? Yes, I was. Yeah. I, can you can you tell us what that was like? What what was? Can you give us your experience to what it was like to release um, a martial arts movie in London um, at that time? In in well, I, I, I had a ball in London for the UK release of The Man from Hong Kong. Uh, yeah. I was twenty nine and kind of full of myself and. Nothing has changed. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I hope I'm, I'm less obnoxious now, uh, but, uh, uh, but I, I try to be obnoxious in a humorous way because I don't really take myself very seriously. I take my work yeah. seriously. Uh, yeah. but, uh, I just believe that we should all have fun while making movies. And I, you, you make good movies by making everyone around you feel good. And you know, I yeah. digress. Uh, but uh, Hong Kong, uh, Man from Hong Kong was a wonderful uh, promotional experience for me in the UK because uh, I got on radio and I got a couple of you know, minor uh, regional television interview uh, and yeah, they couldn't get me off. You know, I, I, as you know, I hate to chat. Uh, and uh, so uh, I had a, had a ball uh, and was therefore attended the press screening uh, at the right. London Pavilion of the man from Hong Kong uh, and had the effrontery to get up on the stage in my brown or my tan Hong Kong made leather suit uh, and address a fairly full stalls auditorium of, uh, uh, of press uh, and said, hello, thank you for coming to the movie. We had such fun making this film. You know, it took us 10 weeks uh, to do this and uh, it only cost you know, $500,000. Um, I hope you, you know, it, it, it was my, my idea to satirize the, you know, the, the, the invincible superhero and the, yet the appalling amount of uh, destruction of property, not to mention loss of life that occurs in the pursuit of, of justice. And, you know, I, <laughs> Briefly, where it summarized the subtext of the film, and I try to do this with humor. So I hope you get the joke because I was worried that they would just think it's another piece of chop stocky, uh, and I was not having enough faith in advance in all my own jokes. Uh, so um, I, I I did this uh, and and got a, you know a, a, an obliging round of applause when I left because you know, I made sure. I I, I'd have been, I'd have been putting that right there. Yeah. Another thing that's in the, uh, the British Film Institute monthly bulletin was there, and they mentioned yeah, right. it in their review, and they said it was a uh, an example of majesté laissé. Uh, oh my goodness me! Yeah, yeah, that one should never address the critics. Oh no, 
A filmmaker yeah. should never address the. Well, I, I doubt it was a, a plummy critic. It was probably you know, someone who you know, didn't like my plummy sound of voice. I don't know, but uh, uh, I don't know. It, but it, the, the, they didn't particularly get it. Um, no. uh, anyway, so but most of the press, uh, I've got a you know, great press ad which has lots of quotes. I don't know whether I think that's somewhere online that can be found. News of the World, Sunday Telegraph, Daily Telegraph, yeah. Daily Mail, yeah. all action, great fun. Uh, they they absolutely responded to my prompt, and and then they enjoyed the movie. And didn't yeah. object, yeah. didn't resent. Well, the I did. so, so, so did I. Affrontery yeah. works. Yeah, absolutely. Now, another little big question is um, Did you choose Sky High by Jigsaw? Uh, and what a lovely choice because it actually rated in the British pop charts. How did yeah. that come about? And the Japan, yeah, Sky High rated in the British pop charts, the American, the Australian, and the Japanese pop charts. Uh, and uh, but we got it by accident. Um, the composer of, of Man from Hong Kong, Noel Quinlan, who's a brilliant com Australian composer uh, with a very interesting career worth looking up and has done a lot of Chinese music. Uh, he's, he's married, he married a Chinese girl in, in Hong Kong, uh, Australia. And he, he, he um, now lives back in, I think in, back in, in, in uh, Sydney. Uh, anyway, Noel Quinlan wrote a terrific score. I said, make it bondish uh, and do what you can, uh, you know, do your own thing, but I want that bond flavor. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and I think he really hit the mark and came time for the title song. Uh, and it, 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 you, you don't get a hit song called The Man From Hong Kong. No, so uh, uh, even when someone can sing. Uh, and so I thought, well, uh, give me a kind of Matt Munro Bond. Yeah, a male singer, Matt Munro Bond song, you know, uh, as he had done, uh, God, I was momentary blanking. Uh, uh, from, from Rush With Love. From Rush With Love, yes, that's right. My favorite. Of the, yeah. of the, of the early ones. Um, and uh, so he hit the mark with a song called Power. Um, All right. Which, uh, uh, he's the man with the power. That was one of my ad lines, actually. He's the man with the power. Uh, and it's, you, you find it in one of the press ads somewhere, an early Hong Kong press ad, um, but, uh, or a, a pre can press ad. Um, uh, anyway, so. I thought it worked well, and it worked for the four minutes of the opening title. Uh, and we had no plans for a, a single. But when the British distributor saw it, they said, you know, if we had a hit song, that would help broaden the appeal of the film from just this core martial arts market that is yeah. just beginning. Uh, yeah. Not yet reached this, the the you know the scale that it, it subsequently did, uh, and uh, so we have a connection with Leeds Music, and they have this new band called Jigsaw, uh, and they have an arranger, Richard Hewson, who's arranged for the Beatles, for you know a, a whole host of major artists. Um, so why don't he? Why don't they deliver you a song uh, uh, that will play exactly to fit the main title and then a two minute single that we can release. And so that uh, I said, I can't argue with the commercial logic of that. Sorry, Noel, but you know, yeah, I, 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 my vision is flexible even right up to the day of release. Uh, and if I was Stanley Kubrick, I could go back and recut and take take ten flabby minutes out of The Shining and make it the you know, more effective cut that it is today, uh, and so forth. I do that with most movies, actually, because when you're a trailer cutter, um, any film can be good for two and a half minutes, and some of my films are. Uh, so anyway, uh, the but but get back to uh, Sky High. Um, 
you know, Jigsaw uh, and Richard Hewson's arrangement, and look at those very effective opening beats in the opening title sequence uh, that are all, you know, that, that, that's, that's his arrangement and the very effective kick into the song. Um, uh, very Bondish, as, uh, as requested, um, and really sets the tone for the film. Uh, so I couldn't be happier with the end result. Uh, and Noel uh, agrees. And, and the recent DVD, Blu-ray, the recent Blu-ray of Man from Hong Kong, I believe can, uh, now has a selection of Noel's music on it, including the song Power. Oh, wow. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. I'm a fan of get, knowledge today. I, 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 was, I was actually talking to somebody to actually get it Man from Hong Kong released over here. I have the Australian copy because a guy, one of my friends over there, um, who uh, is, is, has done Bruce Lee uh, films and, and documentaries, uh, he sent me, because he said I, I knew how passionate I was about Man from Hong Kong and how much I loved it. Um, so he sent me the DVD, but I didn't know there was a Blu-ray. Um, I will attempt to try and get that. But I'm hoping I might be able to attempt somebody over here to actually release it, and maybe you do something with it, eh? Well, well certainly so, I, I, I will always promote uh, my own films. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, but Umbrella Entertainment uh, control, uh, well, they, they are my distributor for all my, the early work that I control the rights for. Uh, and they have been trying to get a UK deal going. And I don't know what has happened with that. Maybe they did, don't want to pay enough money. Uh, yeah, they, they, I think it was Arrow Films that was they were talking to. And I'm, I'm working with, me and Will are working with Arrow Films. And I was saying, huh. you know, well, Arrow do a good job. I, I, yeah, they I, do. I like Arrow. Uh, I think the people I dealt with are probably left by now, but they, they I like dealing with them uh, on um, Dead End Drive-In, uh, which is one of my yeah. better films. Yeah, um, no, they're, 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 good, they're good people. Right, moving on. Um, although you've been used martial arts, you, you know, you have moved martial arts in your other movies, um, how did you get drawn back in 1988 to make two early Australian martial art movies called Day of the Panther and Strike of the Panther. How did these come about and how happy are you with um, making two martial arts movies back to back? The Panther pictures were a wonderful experience. Uh, some people would think they're totally awful movies, but then they're not, you know, uh, they, they don't you know, share my sense of humor, let's say. Uh, but uh, uh, they came about by accident. Uh, I got a call from a producer on a Wednesday night, and I knew he was shooting in West Australia, and that he was worried. Uh, and he said, uh, I'm not happy with the first few days of shooting, and I've spoken to the investors and, you know, we will fire the director who also wrote the script um, uh, if you will come in and take over immediately uh, and we'll, you, we'll change the script on the run because it's not good, and, uh, uh, but we couldn't get it fixed. Um, so uh, on Thursday, they arranged the ticket and made the deal. So I flew into Perth on Friday morning, having read the scripts on the plane and, you know, agreed they're pretty awful, but they at least provide a coat hanger for a series of um, good fight scenes. So uh, let's see what we can do, because certainly the lead actor is good at fighting. Uh, he has a, a natural grace uh, and... Uh, yeah, the, there's an audience for what he does. And it, that was proven in England, I think, when it was released by, by Guild. I think they put out the VHS back in the day. And, and Eddie Stasek and Jim Richards, the choreographer and his usual villain, um, actually did live shows uh, to, in, in shopping malls to promote the Panther pictures in the UK. Uh, and uh, so that, that obviously worked for somebody. Uh, and uh, people still like them today because they are campy. Uh, uh, they're self-satirical of the absurdities of the plotting of these kinds of movies. Um, I just reveled in them. Uh, I, 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 
I mean, you can't eliminate the absurdities. You might as well embrace them uh, yeah. and make them fun. So that uh, and celebrate the 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 you know the cliches and uh, the standard tropes of the genre. So I flew into Perth on the, the Friday morning uh, and thought, you know, let's start with an action scene on Saturday, uh, and during that action scene, we can take a, a a look at all the other problems the script has and the cast has. In fact, it was pretty clear to me that several members of the cast needed to be replaced and they were not well chosen in the first place. Uh, so we ended up uh, recasting four parts <clears throat> and cutting characters and adding new characters and bringing in two completely new characters for the second film to be played by Rowena Wallace and John Stanton. Uh, and we rewrote recast, rechose locations on a daily and nightly basis for eight weeks. And thus both films were shot back to back with interwoven schedules. One of the challenges of the schedule was the availability of qualified martial arts performers in Perth, uh, you know, five hours fly, flight from the East Coast. Uh, uh, and we had brought Guy, we brought Guy Norris in before he became the big stunt choreographer that he now and second unit director of Fury Road that he now is, um, and great guy. Uh, uh, I worked with him on BMX Bandits and Five Mile Creek, but we brought him in and uh, and a team. But you, we needed a lot of fist fodder for Eddie, and. Um, and we were going to run out of fist fodder that, uh, and they all you know, needed to be put down for good at the end of each fight. So initially we had uh, the opening fight scene in the film um, has people in masks. Uh, and uh, uh, we even had a, a joke at the expense of the mask because when you rip the mask off, then his face is painted exactly like the mask. Uh, but I just thought that would be my comment on masks. But uh, uh, the that enabled us, therefore, to disguise the identity of these three uh, stunt fighters, and uh, yeah. so they they performed in subsequent fights initially with beards, uh, moustaches, uh, uh, change change of hairstyle. Uh, and uh, finally, in hockey masks, at the in Strike of the Panthers climax, yeah. Yeah. so short of fighters, I even had Jim Richards, who was playing the villain, put on ninja uh, uh, black you know, pajamas yeah. and a hockey mask to add to the numbers in one fight scene uh, because he wouldn't be recognizable. Um, yeah. uh, anyway, so it, it was. You know, somehow I knew at the very beginning that uh, I, I could make this work if I could just generate, you know, three or or, or four minutes, but th certainly three minutes of visually, you know, exciting, usable footage um, uh, every day. Uh, uh, that would be good. I and mean, I had to make two 85-minute films in two four-week shoots uh, with interwoven schedules. Uh, and yeah, look, they have their shortcomings and the second film naturally needs seven minutes of the high spots of the first film uh, as a reprise. And just in case you forgot, uh, this is what has already happened. Uh, vital is this complex story we're about to tell you. Um, uh, so, uh, I, but I think that that's, that's fun. And uh, the, the audience that saw the, only the sequel really appreciated that. Uh, it was screened at, a, screened at the Hollywood Theater in Portland in my presence in front of 300 people. And they just, they loved it. Anyway, you, you, you have to be of a certain postmodern frame of mind, let's say, uh, to appreciate some of my films. And uh, the Panther pictures are a, a glorious ode to the, the late 80s fashion. Uh, late 80s fashion. They, 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 they are. They are what they are, and they're beautiful, mate. Um, as I said, the wonderful thing about it is there were two Australian 
you know, you didn't you didn't get too many Australian martial arts movies. Um, yeah, there could have been many more, and I should have made more. Uh, but yeah. they were not popular. There was a cultural cringe in Australia. There was a, yeah. you know, the 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 you know the ruling of elite of arts culture basically thought, you know, these are B or C grade uh, entertainment. We should be making things that are of, of a, on a higher intellectual level. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I, 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 I go to the cinema to be entertained and that's what you do Brian you entertain me and that's what I love well you see that to me there is no worst part in making any film it's a great privilege to make a film uh, very few people get that opportunity and I've made 41 long forms and directed episodes for 12 television series so you know I'm happy as a pig in shit you know um, who could wish for better uh, so, uh, so therefore, every filmmaking experience to me uh, uh, is is fun. Now, obviously, some had greater challenges than others, um, and the the less money you have to work with, the harder it is to achieve the quality that you want. So, in that regard, that would be my kvetch uh, uh, about you know low budget martial arts movies. Uh, and dramatize documentaries, but uh, I just love the process. So uh, I, I, I don't think of the, uh, I, I don't actually carry memories of the stresses involved. You know, I just think that was fun and, and I got away with it. You know, I, I brought it home. I got, a, it was a finished uh, saleable film uh, that uh, didn't bankrupt anybody. and. Yeah, you know, everyone got their pound of flesh. All the stakeholders got their pound of flesh. Some made more money than others, but uh, you know, with their tax breaks and uh, the return of their investment, they did okay. Um, this is just a personal one, so you don't have to answer this if you want. But I always felt that. Uh, how did you feel? Um, never to meet Bruce Lee. We're on that cusp. Um. And what do you feel about his lasting legacy? You know, I think you've said some of it, but I always feel as you were robbed of that, of that, you know, you were on the plane and stuff like that. How does that ever bother you or anything? Or do you think, well, it's just one of those life circumstances? Well, you know, a life filled with regret is, is, is a, a sad life. Uh, and so I think uh, uh, I was very lucky to, you know, have, as I said, had the opportunities that I've had. Who knows what the forks in the road are? Um, and if Bruce had not died, uh, he would not uh, have gone on, I think, to have become uh, a leading figure in world cinema. He might have become uh, an, an Asian Scorsese, perhaps, because wow. he wanted to introduce more uh, Asian philosophy and Asian culture into martial arts movies. He knew that the action and the violence could get the audience, but while they were there, they were going to get you know a healthy dose of you know this is the way we see things yeah. from an Asian point of view. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, whereas, you know, Western films prior to that had tended to use Asia as figures of fun, you know, flower drum song, uh, you know, uh, look at all of the Hollywood, you know, Asian movies, uh, okay. you know, yeah. with some notable exceptions, obviously. But so, uh, you know, Bruce had a, you know, a, a cause uh, that was patriotic, you could say nationalistic, but, you know, it's patri it, it was culturally, you know, patriotic. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's perfectly, you know, legitimate. And so uh, he had a, a grasp of filmmaking that he had absorbed really from a life of being born into a show business family and, and going to America and being on movie sets. And, yeah, he knew how, you know, the, the grammar and syntax of, the, the cinema language worked and and how a film could be organized uh, and so he was you know he was ready when the time came and and you know he, he had budgetary restrictions on the big boss 
so, uh, but he he was able to pull it off, uh, and uh, uh, so he he would have been a leading figure in world cinema if he had if he had not died when he did, because if you know Enter the Dragon uh, was going to come out and be a huge success, way of uh, and the Game of Death would have been finished to his satisfaction, whether it would have been considered too arty for Western audiences um, at that time would have been another matter. But I would have said that, you know, maybe there's some compromise in the editing of it between a Chinese version and a Warner Brothers version would have been arrived at and, uh, and, and found favor with a world audience and perhaps lifted audiences taste as far as martial arts movies was concerned by having these deeper philosophical elements available. Uh, and so that was the gift that he would have given to world cinema. And that's why I, I lament his passing greatly. Now, if, if I had bonded with him uh, at such a meeting and he had accepted my you know, rather you know, naive you know, screenplay premise, um uh and you know it, it was you know it, it was written with a, a degree of irony and uh, you know, whether he would have accepted my western irony uh, uh as an appropriate um mechanism i mean i wanted a chinese dirty harry to uh take the place of the, the usual american who comes to asia uh beats up uh, infinitely more flexible fighters than he is, uh, beds a button couple of Chinese girls and goes home the hero. And I thought, well, why don't we have an, uh, you know, an Asian guy do this? Because I, I'm a multiculturalist. Uh, and I think, you know, the more we have multicultural heroes, the, the, the more likely a more peaceful world uh, will emerge. Uh, but that's just me. Uh, but, uh, um, so I, I've you know, been on that sort of barrow for you know, it, really from my, my teenage years, really. Um, okay. So I, I saw using the sort of a dirty Harry formula of uh, tough, no nonsense cop you know, comes to Australia, which is, you know, has, you know, and his Australian counterparts are mildly racist. Uh, and he shows he's cleverer than they are. And he beats everybody up and blows things up and a uh, you know, good time is had by all. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, if, he'd, if he had seen that, if he'd accepted that pitch uh, and, and, and accepted my, you know, my sense of humor, uh, then who knows what might've happened to my career, but I have not spent any time thinking, oh, what might have been. I've only, my, all my energies have always been in. But, but, but don't you feel, Brian, it's just lovely to hear you talk that what you're hearing is a piece of history there, that you actually took the man from Hong Kong script with you to meet Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee could have, not made of it, could have actually been in the man from Hong Kong. That would have been amazing. Yeah. Yeah, just just point of accuracy. I took a six-page treatment, which of course. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, now the script was somewhat longer. But it just had some of my you know questionable dialogue in it, uh, but all the action beats uh, were, were were there, uh, and uh, um, uh, so uh, and including the grenade in the mouth at the end, uh, which you know was I thought a nice yeah rather shocking shocking moment. I mean. Uh, Hey, you can get blown to pieces. Does it really matter that your head goes first? Uh, you know, but, <laughs> but, well, the irony is, <laughs> I, I see these things. You see, yeah. um, I, 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 I uh, uh, anyway. So, it, but you know, he he might have said, "Don't be ridiculous," and uh, why is this man bothering me? Uh, yeah. So, it, it, like, he would have been entitled to do that. Uh, yeah. I was just a young whippersnapper um, from you know, a culture that tended to treat him as an inferior. So you know, yeah, but he might have seen it the other. He might have seen it the other way, and it, we never yeah. know. We'll never know. But it's nice to know that those little things that you actually took the treatment with you, with that intent, which is which is really interesting. 
Yeah. Right now, let's get to the real big things. Uh, Brian, uh, you've written a book on B movies and you are experiencing the genre. What information would the potential reader gain from this book and who is it aimed at? Okay, would you like me to present the book as I give the answer? I oh, you can do so. Yeah, yeah, do so, do so. I, I, I'd have to go to the other table because the cat will not pick it up for me. Oh, that's a shame. <sighs> I have written this book, Adventures in the B-Movie Trade, in which I had some 50 years plus experience. And I would say this book is aimed at people well, young and old, uh, older people with an interest in the history of media and can see you know, what it was like to make you know, low budget genre movies from the 60s onwards. Uh, and uh, uh, lots of interesting tales of how they're made and uh, and uh, my own personal journey through um, those 50 years. Uh, I hope it will encourage young people uh, who are sort of, you know, there is George on fire, for instance. You see that shot? That's definitely George. That's definitely Jimmy. And <laughs> that's a wet face because he's got gel on his hair and gel on his face. Uh, yeah. just wish it had lasted on that little patch on his wrist, uh, uh, which, yeah. Anyway, so 580 pages, uh, full color in the hardcover edition, uh, only black and white in the cheaper paperback edition, but um, it covers every film that I've made and it is a, uh, and every television series that I participated in. And it is um, a portrait of an era. Uh, for, for those that are interested in such things. And if you're 18 and thinking about getting into the movie business, um, then I hope it inspires you to overcome all the obstacles that you will now encounter uh, with the new technology, now that you know, filmmaking has been democratized by uh, you know, technological advances and you can can make a movie on your phone, and edit it on your phone. Uh, and uh, I'd go cross-eyed, but uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I call me old fashioned. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, uh, so I, you know, uh, I, I've written the book, not just as sort of hooray for me, um, uh, though obviously a bit of vanity does enter into it, but I do chronicle as many of my mistakes as possible because I think it's important that to, that, that you learn from your mistakes and I've learned from a few of them um, uh, and the others I just repeat. Uh, but uh, the, you know, I, I, I offer it as, um, a, a, you know, a, an inspiration, let's say, to people who, who want to really put in a lot of effort and dedication uh, to to get into, let's say, the recorded entertainment business. Uh, yeah. Get stage, screen, television, you know, TikTok, you know, music videos, whatever. Um, here's one man's journey. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I want women to read this book, even though they may think that uh, this is excessively macho, but, uh, uh, but uh, it, 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 it yeah it's it's for everybody i think there's a degree of humor in it and uh, and that's really you know uh, what i hope what i hope people have is a good time reading it which is what i hope uh, they have from seeing my films absolutely um one of your greatest followers or maybe i'm wrong but uh, it seems to be one of your greatest followers is quentin tarantino um how has your work inspired him in his productions well, I, I'm sure the fact of the matter is that every film you see from childhood onwards, you know, lodges something that, that you liked about it and it's going to have an influence upon you some, in some way. And uh, I know I've been influenced by Hitchcock, not that I've made any specifically Hitchcockian films, um, but his eye, uh, his sense of pace, um, uh, it, you know, we, we all have our influences. So I think when Quentin was first seeing my films from 
1975 onwards, when the man from Hong Kong was first played in Los Angeles and uh, briefly, uh, uh, but uh, it was it, it, it failed in its first release in the US. Um, they, 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 they retitled it The Dragon Flies, and there were far too many dragon ripoffs uh, that had flooded yeah. the box office by then. So that was yeah. an unwise marketing move by Fox. Uh, but uh, so uh, he, I think that was the first one of mine he saw, and he certainly saw it in. Uh, on the Z channel when it was sold to them a few years later, uh, the, the first cable channel. Um, but as when he worked in a video store, uh, some of my films were coming through uh, as just straight VHS releases. Uh, yeah. And that's where he saw um, Siege of Firebase Gloria and um, Dead End Drive-In and, uh, uh, and so forth. So, it's very kind of him to have given me a nod uh, in an interview with Entertainment Weekly where he referred to me as uh, Brian Trenchard's with us, his uh, favorite obscure director. And, and, and now, look, I, I think obscure is better than dead. Uh, they're, 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 the dead have their place, you know, and they have their honor too. Uh, and, uh, and one day I will be dead. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, and so kind of, I think of Hilaire Belloc's epitaph, uh, when I am dead, I hope it may be said, his sins were scarlet, but his books were red. Oh, very good. Uh, I very hope good. My, 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 my sins are scarlet, but I, my films hopefully will be digitally read and my book will be read. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, anyway, that, that was kind of him to do that. Um, and the, and I really like his style. I, I, I like his quirky anarchic style and the way he messes with uh, you know your mind with an un, you know, unreliable narrator uh, with you know you know sw switching the uh, the uh, uh, this you know the time frames around and uh, uh, yeah you know, Pulp Fiction was a you know a, a masterpiece uh, and uh, uh, so. Um, I always like what he does, and I think *Inglorious Bastards* is one of the most. It is the most incredible World War film, uh, World War II film ever made. Uh, but uh, obviously, there are many worthy depictions of World War II. Uh, but I, I thought, as a you know, uh, as a sly look at it uh, from you know, the 2003 perspective, let's say, uh, um, or uh, sorry, it was later than that. Um, after, you know, for all the years, just sort of shrink it to one. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, everything he does, and his last one, God, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, again, another masterpiece. Yeah, he can make long films that do not appear long. Uh, uh, if you think they're long, you're not paying attention. They're dense, they're rich in all sorts of nuance and flavor. Uh, and uh, that's why they, they bear repeating. And uh, so uh, I, I, so I look forward. I just, I just hope he doesn't stop at ten movies. You know, like he said, he's going to. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I may see him. He may come to Portland in the next couple of weeks. Maybe I will see him then. Well, give him my best, and we, we love him, and we, we love what he does, oh. and we love, and we, lo and as you can see, I really, really have. It's been a total honour, Brian, a total honour. It's been a long time coming. And as I say, um, as a as a big Kung Fu film fan, it was started in 1973. Um, to go see uh, Man from Hong Kong was an absolute delight. Um, oh. I do have the quad. I do have the quad of it. Um, and I have sent you uh, Dragon, the cover of Dragon magazine. I would like to see you see it just to see if you actually knew. Yeah, um, or you, if you just sent it to me now yeah i've just sent, like I sent you I, in between one of the meetings i think i sent it to you just a little it's a yellow cover well that yeah that was all that was on land you see there that, that was his yeah. takeoff point in, in the movie and we had to see him actually starting to run and uh <clears throat> so <clears throat> they towed the kite to, to inflated and then enough 
to to get his legs off, and then we could uh, uh, cut to a, a wider shot with Grant. There. So, so would you like that magazine, Brian? Yes, please. And um, uh, my address. Let me do a reply. You, uh, if you've been martial arts, you know, reporting for 30, fifty years. Yeah, um, I, I worked for a magazine called Martial Arts Illustrated. Um, and basically covered all the movies, reviewed everything um, that I could get my hands on. So I've been in the the martial art movie thing and and still continue. There's one thing that I am asked you a question about, which is really well, important. Well, and, and, I, and, I, and I was I missed it. You actually wrote two magazines. Uh, you brought out two magazines. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Because they were called the World of Martial Arts, I think. No, there was this, it's called the World of Kung Fu. And World, World of Kung Fu, uh, sorry. The highest edition. So I I pumped out the magazine at the same time as the documentary. Right. And uh, it managed to sell you know, about three quarters of the print run. Um, so, uh, and I, I think I have a copy in the cupboard there. So if you want me to talk okay. about it, I can present yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be lovely. So this was it. Oh, wow. Oh, that is fantastic. I, yeah, I got, maybe somebody has copies on eBay. I don't know. Yeah, I'll have to have a look. I'll have to look for those, definitely. Probably that is beautiful. Be, might have been a 20,000 copy print run and uh, pretty much sold out. And then I did a, a, would have sold out. Then I did the revised edition, just had a yeah. few more pictures, a few more pages. And that, you know, that, almost sold out that, that it did okay yeah. uh so anyway this is the yeah and it was uh sold for 80 cents and it had obviously some color pictures uh but wow black and white uh and uh, so jeet kune do was uh yeah yeah uh, and uh, this was another center spread uh um, oh yeah, King Boxer, King Boxer. King Boxer. Yes, that was that was a goodie. Was that called Five Fingers of Death? In yeah, uh, Five Fingers of Death. It's it's low lie. Yeah, and so we had some aspects of martial arts training, um, and yeah, so there was yeah, yeah, Bruce again, yeah, enter, enter, and uh, we had some some. You know, local guys who demonstrated some moves. Uh, wow! So forth. Anyway, so that was that was. The so and you did and did you do two two issues of that? Did you? Yes, I, I did two issues. There was a revised issue, uh, though I think we kept the same front cover because, well, how can you argue with that? Uh, no. Uh, I also was at the same time pumping out four four of these a year. Uh, oh wow! Well, yeah, you know, just as you have to be a Renaissance person in Australia in the uh, 70s. And so, yeah, yeah. 60 page, same, same uh, publishing company, 60 page glossy with color, color pages uh, inter interwoven. And it sold, you know, very well. Of course, I, I was on a fixed fee, uh, but, uh, um, uh, but I, you know, I basically was the, I was the, the founding editor. Uh, wow. And, yeah, uh, and uh, um, and uh, yeah. Similarly, I I credit for this too. So wow, oh, that is that is that's that's definitely to look for. I love that. I love that. I don't know where you might find it, um, but we'll see. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll I'll keep having a look. Don't worry. Hmm. That's fantastic. Well, um, what attracted you when you were um, a young man um to a life in film and media well i just have always been attracted to to movies i think the first experience of the moving image uh was when i was in libya when my father commanded an air force base there and i was probably four i, I went there at uh, just turning two uh and came back at just over five uh and uh, um Sometimes they would have a 16 millimeter projector, and uh, on you know in the the the, the quarters for uh, the 
you know, the, you know, the troops there, uh, they would show movies projected onto a sheet hung on a clothesline uh, just uh, outside the world uh, with, with the, the runway <laughs> uh, beyond uh, at night. And, I, uh, and so that was my first introduction to cinema and, um, and probably sitting on my mother's knee and feeling, looking at the interesting gizmo that created these images and sent them in the, a, a projector. And uh, so I was introduced to a projector at my first school and learned how to work it and uh, um, made eight millimeter films at my second school. And that got me my first uh, job. I, I said I could edit film and I, I, I edited somebody's 16 millimeter footage of, um, of uh, for the central electricity generating board of how, how they could wow. put up a put up pylons uh, without by bringing in all the material by helicopter and without having to chew up farmers' land uh, and so they they shot footage of this and they had they didn't know what to do with it and. Um, um, the executive's daughter happened to be my girlfriend when I was 18, and she said, oh, Brian can do it. So I did. And then I could say, ah, I have edited 16 millimeter film. And that when I went to Australia was the, uh, yeah, I was able to say that. Uh, and within three weeks of arriving in Australia, got a job cutting news film uh, in, in, for Channel 10 in Sydney. This led to making promos and Promos led to making trailers for theatrically released films, which uh, an American company recruited me for. Uh, with they had an operation in England, uh, and I came back to England, made trailers for Hammer Horrors. Um, you made you made uh, an interesting you made an interesting trailer that I'm quite interested in. Is called you did the trailer trailer for Crossplot with uh, yes. Roger Moore. Yes. Yes. Uh, and that, yes. and I have that. I actually have that because it actually turns up on Crossplot when it was released. Uh, that trail is on there. So is it that's it. That's yeah. interesting. Is it on YouTube? It, okay. I don't think it is. It's on a. It's just on a DVD. Um, I can oh. get you one and send you. No problem. Yeah. Well, there's, a, there's a new. Yeah. So uh, when I saw it, I thought, "Ooh, Crossplot." Not many people actually know about that film, and. Uh, you know, I think it was with uh, Roger Moore and a guy called Alexis Canner, who um, had a quite a big part with Patrick McGowan in The Prisoner. So, mm. um, yeah, lovely, yeah. Lo lovely trailer. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad you like it. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, um, I mean, my trailers tended to be, by modern standards, too long. Uh, and, you know, and, and I'm certainly guilty of arch commentary lines. Um, but uh, anyway, I've made over a hundred trailers for theatrically released films, and I still yeah. sort of, it had that as a parallel career. You have to, yeah, them. yeah. You have to. So, so you really got the film bug from a, an early age, really. Then I, I, I got the virus, you know, really. Yeah. The, uh, uh, the, the cinema virus, which I caught in Libya. Uh, there, there's an interesting story for you, uh, and, yeah. and, uh, and it's been with me ever since. Uh, and I'm glad of it. Uh, so. Yeah. When you were younger, because just because we, of course, we're, we're World of Martial Arts TV, so of course we're going to lean a lot on the the martial arts side. Um, and I think I've got some things there that you might remember, and you might say no. But um, what was as a young man before you actually did any martial arts movies? Had you had any introduction to martial arts or done any martial arts when Not you were younger? Asian martial arts, no. I boxed at both my prep school and my, my subsequent boarding school, Wellington College. Uh, and, uh, and there I took up fencing and eventually captained the fencing team. We beat Eaton in my year. Um, and uh, uh, so um, uh, I, you know, I, I therefore, you know, have an interest in, you know, personal combat, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, um, uh, hi, I, I'm in. Hi, Mitzi. I'm in the middle of a podcast, and we're being recorded. And let me just tell my 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 hosts here. I'm speaking to the wonderful Mitzi Capture, who oh wow, my, my star uh, in the Silk Stalkings 
uh, television oh, yeah. experience. Do you yeah. remember Silk Stockings? Yeah, I do. Remember Definitely. Silk Stockings. You see, you made a hit there, Mitzi. Uh, and uh, uh, she, she's a wonderful actress uh, and still acts, but is, is, is a good woman. And uh, when I left the show, they, they, they really wanted me to stay, but I, I think I, uh, uh, anyway, the other people wanted me to leave. But uh, Mitzi and, uh, and Rob Estes, her co-star, presented me with a, a tote bag to take away to commemorate one of my favorite sayings on the set, which was, fuck me dead. Uh, <laughs> but something happened, you know, a piece of scenery would fall down or, or uh, something, someone wouldn't turn up. And so you have to quickly work your way around that, which is the joys of episodic television, of course. And Mit Mitzi was one of those wonderful actresses who was always letter perfect with her lines, sometimes on 10 page days. Uh, and so it is, uh, well, I, I have perfect recall, Mitzi. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so we've been playing phone tag uh, because she came up to Portland and I couldn't actually see her. So, um, uh, so Mitzi, please, can we speak uh, another time? Trees have fallen across my driveway and wonderful British people are podcasting me and it's, it's a busy morning. Uh, so she says hello. Hello to you. Hi. Yes, we won't remember the show very well. It doesn't get shown enough, but uh, there we go. Yeah, um, I remember the um, I remember you and the uh, co-star. What was the co-star's name? The the Rob gentleman. Estes. Yeah. yeah. What what what? He appeared in something else as well. I can't remember what he else is he's uh, famous for. But yeah, I remember him turning up in uh, quite a lot of stuff. Yeah, it needs it needs repeating. Definitely needs repeating on TV. But we don't get it at the moment. We might get it soon, but not at the moment. It's, not, it's on DVD, you can... Uh, oh, yeah, know. yeah, yeah. It's on DVD for sure, yeah. Anyway. I was amazing. I had no idea I was going to meet all of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, Mitzi, yeah. I'll, I'll let you go, and yeah. I'll, I'll wait for the next interruption, which will be probably people trying to cut up my trees that have fallen across the <laughs> Anyway, it's a... It's, oh, that's fine. Right. That's well, a, oh. that. Yes. You see... I like actors. Oh, I like to blow them up and crash cars into them and all sorts of other things. But, you know, I actually like them. Uh, and I think they, you know, they have a difficult job. Uh, yeah. and so actors that I get along with, and that generally pretty much everybody, um, I keep in touch with them when I feel they've done extra special duty. Uh, yeah. and, and, and she always did. And though it's been since 1991, 92, uh, that we had, that I did those five episodes, um, I've always remembered her fondly and we've kept in touch over the years. I'm envious of you. And you, you got Nicole Kidman before she sort of like knew anything about filming or anything like that, really, I think so. Well, I, I suppose so. She was, she was always, I think, probably an actress from birth uh, and yeah. always watched <laughs> To express herself in that way and uh, uh, so there was no doubt that she was going to you know you know work in yep. it I was lucky to get her she'd shot one sort of ensemble children's film on 16 millimeter before yeah uh, just before BMX bandits um, and I was happy to have put her on the, the big screen in 35 millimeter scope uh, yeah, where, where she belongs. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. Anyway, she's uh, the, the camera loves her, uh, and uh, she has a natural, yeah, just a natural dramatic instinct, and uh, and I think some good comedy timing. So yeah. Anyway, I, that was good, and I always knew she was going to be a star, and I said so in a um, uh, in a newspaper interview. Uh, for the the Daily Mirror in you know, I think I've, it's in my book, uh, but I, 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 I said she was going to have you know outstanding roles in every decade of her life and end up as a, probably playing feisty grandmothers like Catherine Hepburn. And I said that when she was sixteen, and it would seem that I was going to be right. Thank you very life. much for your time. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Can't wait, yeah. and I'll send you a present soon.
Sports Social Podcast Network. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.